The Bible says, Romans 9, beginning verse 6, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all the children. But in Isaac thy seed shall be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children not being yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Father, I thank you again for your word, and we're grateful, Lord, that, that you communicate to us, and you care what we know about you, and, and you owe us none of these things, but you have spoken to us and given us a revelation that tells us about yourself. Without this, Lord, we could not know you. And we thank you for that. Lord, I pray as we study your word this morning, help us, Lord, to feel the weight of it. Help us to um, help us to know its importance and to apply it to our lives, to accept it and to, and to live by it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the song we, we sang just a little while ago, um, Standing on the Promises. Good old... Good old hymn, and, uh, and relevant just as much today as it was the day it was written. And I love the, uh, I think this is the second stanza, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. What does it mean to stand on the promises? Well, it means that you believe them. And believing them, you order your life in accordance with God's promises. You go to church on Sunday because you believe in God's promises. You give money because you believe in God's promises. You tell others about Jesus because you stand on God's promises. You, um, you pray because you believe in and you stand on God's promises. You stand at the coffin of a loved one and you feel comfort in your heart knowing that you'll see that person again because you stand on God's promises. You sorrow, but not as this world sorrows. You sorrow as one having hope because you stand on God's promises. You have joy inexpressible and full of glory because you stand on God's promises. It's not always easy to believe this way, though, is it? Sometimes it is difficult to stand on God's promises. And that's why that hymn is so relevant. The hymn writer wrote about the howling storms of doubt and fear assailing us. Have you ever been assailed by those? Um, what storms of doubt and fear attack our confidence? What can make us fail to fully trust the promises of God? Well, the greatest tempest that attacks our faith when it, it, it's, it, it's like this. One of, the, one of the great attacks, one of the great storms and tempests is this. When God has made a promise to someone, and then it seems like he failed to fulfill that promise. It doesn't have to be you. It can be somebody else that you observe. But you see in the life of somebody else, and it looks like, at least to all to, to the way you can understand it, that God's promise has failed in that person's life. And one of the most glaring cases is the case of Israel. And we have had missionaries come through our church who were on their way to Israel to share the gospel to the lost in Israel. Isn't that supposed to be the other way around? Israel is who? They're God's chosen people, right? They should be sending missionaries to America, not Americans sending missionaries to Israel. God has promised, um, God has promised us that 
nothing can separate us from his love in Christ, right? That's what chapter 8 is all about. But didn't God make similar promises to Israel? God says the church are the people of God. God said in the Old Testament that Israel was the people of God. What happened to them? If God's promises to Israel do not hold true, then we have no reason to be confident that his promises to us will hold true. That's the problem Paul addresses in Romans 9 through 11. That's what these uh, few chapters are really about. Why does Paul take up this subject now? Why is that on his mind? And he, well, he's written at length about our security in Christ. That's what chapter 8 is all about, right? And in chapter 8, we have many promises to claim. Many promises upon which to stand. Most notably, the climax of the chapter, here we find the promise that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But then... Paul, as we noticed last week, Paul pulls us off that mountain of glory and plunges us into the valley of sorrow because Israel is lost and it is breaking Paul's heart. He begins chapter 9 by lamenting their lost condition, even wishing that, that if it were possible, he could be cut off from Christ so that his brethren, according to the flesh, Israel could be saved. Look at how he begins chapter 10. In verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is this, that they might be saved. What does that imply? They're not saved. Israel is lost, and that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Because in chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, this is what Paul wrote, They're Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, are, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. So God gave Israel the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law, and the promises. How can they be lost, the people of God? God gave them promises. What does that say about them? What does it say about us? Can we trust God's promises in Christ to be true for us. I mean, what if a thousand years from now there's a new test, a new New Testament of Scripture, and and God is writing to new people that have somehow found a new plan of salvation and has found that that we're the ones that are lost. Can we trust God's promises to us? Paul wrote Romans chapter nine through chapter 11 to talk about Israel and their role in the gospel story and he did that to respond to this very crisis do you see that crisis a God that does not keep his promises cannot save his children that is a fact and this is not just a problem for Jews it's not something we can say well that's them we can just ignore it because if it was Paul would have ignored it it wouldn't be in scripture and we could just move on to chapter 12 and, and get on with it. But God gave Israel his word. God gave Israel his promise. Yet they are lost and they reject the gospel wholesale. This is a crisis not just for them but for us. And so it raises the question. Has God's word failed? God gave promises to Israel. He called them his people. And they are lost. Did his promise to them fail? Has God's word failed? Well, I think you probably know what the answer to that is, right? So I'll just tell you. God's word has not failed. And that's what Romans chapter 9 is all about. Uh, and it says right here, he starts out this section, not as though the word of God has taken none effect. He had just told us that the children of Israel are lost in spite of all that they've been given, and he's brokenhearted about it. And that raises in his mind this crisis, and so he plunges right into it this way. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect. Even if it seems that way, God's word cannot and has not failed. Even though Israel has rejected Christ, God's word stands. That's the point. And Paul states this directly in verse 6. Here he lays out his main thesis 
not as though the word of God has taken none effect. The word translated hath taken none effect, all that phrase is one word, and it means really to fall to the ground. Literally, it says God's word has not fallen. It hasn't fallen down and become useless. When God says the word of God, what does he mean by that? Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. What does he mean by the word of God? Well, the word of God mentioned in verse 6 is that word which contains the privileges that have just been listed for Israel in verses 4 and 5. So the word of God is God's Old Testament word, specifically his promises to Israel. And, and they're all lost, they're all rejecting Christ, and the question is, has that failed? And the answer is no, it has not failed. No matter what we read in Romans chapters 9 through 11, we must keep in mind that everything written there, everything written in these chapters, is written to support this statement, God's word has not failed. So, has God's word failed? No, it has not fallen. It cannot fall. And to support this statement, Paul defines God's purpose in giving his promises. Why did God give promises? What was his purpose in that? And so to prove that God's word hasn't failed, Paul wants us to be absolutely clear on what his, um, what his purpose is in giving his promises. And God's purpose is is to, in giving promises, God's purpose is to call out a people for himself. God's salvation historical program features his covenants and his promises that are given to his people, and they all have one purpose, and all of these promises are, are directed toward this purpose, and that purpose is to create a people of God, to call out a people for his name that would serve to the praise of the glory of his grace, so that throughout all eternity, God God would be glorified in his saints. That is the purpose of his promises. All the benefits that come with his promises. And you think about it. You read the book of Revelation. Someday God is going to wipe all tears from our eyes. But those are not that, that scene where there's no more death and dying and all of those things. That's not the purpose of God's promises. That's the benefits. And we, we love that. God's purpose for his promises are so that we would be to the praise of the glory of his grace. That we would be the people of God, his own special people, um, and, and the people that reflect his glory for all eternity. That's the purpose, to call out a people for himself. This is ultimately stated by Peter to be God's purpose for New Testament believers as well as Old Testament believers. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And, and that just means a people specially belonging to God. Uh, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are now the people of God, which had not attained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And so you see, he called, God called us out of darkness into his marvelous light for the purpose of making us his people. When God called Abraham and then Isaac after him, God called these men for the purpose of creating a people of God. Notice, after Paul states that God's word will not fall, he explains. And uh, see the word for after this statement. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for... They are not all Israel which are of Israel. And that for just introduces an explanation. Here's why it hasn't failed. Um, and so he says, Neither because are they the seed of Abraham, are they the children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. And now Paul is explaining why God's promise to Israel still stands, even though most of them are lost, even though it seems like it doesn't stand. Well, how does that work? Well, first, Paul makes a distinction between two different Israels. There's a physical Israel, a biological Israel. And then within physical Israel, there is a spiritual Israel. Uh, uh, regenerated, I guess you could put it, Israel. And this, is, and, and this distinction, where it says they are not all Israel which are of Israel, this distinction explains why God's word has not failed. Then Paul points out that 
not every person who belongs to physical Israel belongs to spiritual Israel. That's, and to prove that point, Paul looks back to Israel's founding father. Anytime you're talking about Israel and their identity, you have to bring up Abraham, right? And so their founding father, Abraham, and he uses Abraham's story to prove that not all physical members of, of the Israelite tribe are members of spiritual Israel. And this is possible because, because not every descendant of Abraham counts in God's eyes as a child of Abraham and thus a child of God. I hope you're with me. This can get kind of, um, it, it can kind of get wound tightly, but I hope I'm making this more clear than mud. Uh, but uh, in Romans 9, 7, he says, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they the children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. He's quoting from Genesis Chapter 21, verse 12, where it says, In all that Sarah hath said to thee, hearken unto her voice, for Isaac shall, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And when God told Abraham that Abraham was having a difficult time with what he needed to do, he needed to cast Hagar and Ishmael out of his household. And God, Sarah had told him to do that. And here's God saying, Go ahead and listen to your wife, do that. Kick her and him out of your immediate family because my seed my children your descendants are going to be called named in Isaac that's what it means named Isaac was the son that counted not Ishmael God would call out a people for his name through Isaac only that's the promise and that's that's the purpose of his promise so that he gave his promise to Isaac to that end that there would be a people named, called. Paul almost always uses this word called to refer to God calling his people to salvation. When you read the word called in Paul's writings, he is usually, and I haven't, I, I don't know if I can think of an instance where he doesn't, he's usually talking about calling his people to salvation and they always, in those contexts, always answer the call. And so called is synonymous almost with, with being saved. Has God's word failed almost all Israelites are lost. How, how Has God's word failed? No. God is accomplishing his purpose to call out a people for his name. And Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and they might have looked around and said, you know what, most of us are Gentiles. But they could also put this together, but Jews and Gentiles alike in this church, we are a people for God's name. His purpose is still moving on in this world. And it still, though, it still seems like most Israelites should be saved, right? You read the Old Testament, all the heroes of the faith, they're, they're, they're Jews. Most, most of them, all right? Uh, and so if God gave them promises, as Paul said in verses 4 and 5, and they are mostly lost, how can we trust his word? Well, that brings us to a, a third heading here, and that is this, God's promise accomplishes his purpose for those to whom it is given. And that's the important part. It accomplishes his purpose to those he gave his promise to. God did not give his promise to everyone. God gave his promise to certain people and he keeps his promise to those people and his promises accomplishes his purpose in the people to whom he gave his promise. Um, Maybe I could illustrate it this way. A father of three boys takes his boys to the park to play on the playground. And there are several other boys there that are also playing. And after a while, an ice cream truck comes in playing the magic song, right? And he comes in and plays the loud magic song that everybody all of a sudden wants ice cream, whether they like ice cream or not. They play the magic song and you know you have to have one. And the father called out, hey boys, come here. I'm going to buy each of you an ice cream. To his dismay, 13 boys responded to the call. And there he is standing at the ice cream truck and he's got five bucks in his pocket and 13 boys. Well, the father bought ice cream for only his three little boys. The others were disappointed. Let me ask you this question. Did that father break his promise? No. He made a promise to his three boys. And just because those other boys uh, wanted him to buy them ice cream, he had promised his three boys that ice cream. Similarly, this, this, this illustration, this, this analogy isn't perfect. It breaks down all over the place, but hopefully it helps. But similarly, God gave his promise to certain people 
and his promise accomplishes his purpose in those people, and he keeps his word to them. Notice how our text bears this out, all right? God's promise fulfilled his purpose in Isaac, but not in Ishmael, all right? In Isaac, but not Ishmael. In verse 7, again, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted at for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at, the time, uh, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, Paul has just quoted again, as we, we mentioned earlier, Genesis 21 and verse 12. He quotes that in verse 7 here of our text. In verse 8, though, Paul offers his commentary on that text. And Paul identifies two different types of children that were children of Abraham. There are the children of the flesh, and then there's the children of the promise. All right, those are the two different types of children. And therefore, uh, and, and then we have a parallel given. The children of God is given in parallel with um, those who are counted as seed. All right? These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as seed. All right? And the children of the flesh are not the children of God. Therefore, they are not counted as the seed. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Now, who is Paul writing about? He's referring to Ishmael and to Isaac. In Genesis 15, uh, the Bible records that God promised Abraham that his descendants would be like the stars of heaven, like the sand of the seashore. And in verse 6 of that chapter, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But they had a problem. Sarah was barren and she and Abraham were getting quite old. And so Sarah devised a plan to rescue God. She thought, God's not coming through on his promise, and this is where we always get into trouble, right? When God makes a promise, and we've been waiting, and we have to rescue God, get him off the hook. Well, Sarah tries to rescue God and get him off the hook, and here's her cockamamie plan. Abraham, I've got this maid. She's kind of pretty. Why don't you have a sexual union with her, and then she'll have a baby for me. And so they go through with that plan. And, and, and that's recorded in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. And the result of that adulterous sexual union is Ishmael. Ishmael was Abraham's son, naturally. But he was a child of the flesh. He was not a child of faith, not a child of the promise. God made no promise to Ishmael. Um, God's promise in this text is given to Isaac. And we see uh, that the content of this promise is here when Paul quotes Genesis 8, verses 10 and 14, in verse 9 of our text, for this is the word of the promise. All right, here's the promise. At this time, I will come, and Sarah will have a son. The promise is given to Sarah's son, not Hagar's son. So God's promise accomplishes his purpose in those to whom it was given. And he does not fulfill his promise in those to whom he has not given a promise. He fulfilled his word to Isaac, not Ishmael. His word did not fail. And then God gives another example and goes a step further. God's promise fulfilled his purpose in Jacob, not Esau. Remember his purpose? To call out a people for his name that they would be to the praise of the glory of his grace. And God's promise fulfilled his purpose in Jacob, but not Esau. Look at verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger, and it is writ as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. I want you to notice Paul's main point in this section. And I bolded it there on your screen. Verse 11 says that the purpose of God, that, focus on the word that, in order that, the purpose of God according to election might stand. That's really the focal 
uh, point of this paragraph. Paul's point is that God does things this way in order that his electing purpose might stand. And to stand here means to continue, to remain, to not fall. Remember in verse 6, the, the main assertion from Paul is that God's promise, God's word has not fallen. It has not failed. And here he says that in order that the purpose of God according to election might stand, might not fall. This is why I do things this way. So God chose Jacob and not Esau for this reason. So that his electing purpose to call out a people for his name that they would be to the praise of the glory of his grace for all eternity. His purpose according to election would stand. Now. How can God's electing purpose stand and not fall? How is that guaranteed? How can we be sure that it will not falter and God's word will not be broken? Well, we know we can know this because God's electing purpose is founded on God and not man. God is the one who never changes. With him, there is no chance of a shadow, no shadow of turning. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the one who doesn't change. We're very changeable people, right? And so God's electing purpose is grounded on himself and not on us. To prove this, Paul describes God's electing purpose in choosing Jacob over Esau. First, Paul expresses that God's choice of Jacob was an unconditional election. An unconditional choice. In other words, God did not choose Jacob because of something good that he saw in Jacob. Jacob did not meet any conditions in order to cause God to choose him over Esau. Paul demonstrates this by eliminating all possible conditions that could be brought up. He eliminates family and birth as a condition of God's choice. And this would be very very important, especially in the mind of the Jewish readers of Paul's epistle. They would be very invested in a birthright salvation. They would have wanted to believe that, that uh, being born a Jew would make you uh, just be a son of Abraham and you're in. But Paul eliminates family and birth as a connection, uh, condition for God's choice. He says in verse 10, When Rebekah had also conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Now that's a weird way to say it, right? Why describe it that way? She conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Why would he say it that way? Well, probably because someone might object to the first example he brought up. Isaac and Ishmael. They might say Isaac and Ishmael were only half brothers and Ishmael's mother was a Gentile. So of course God chose Isaac. His promises are supposed to be for Jews only. So Paul in his next example goes a step further and he words the passage this way to emphasize that one act of conception produced these twins, Jacob and Esau. They had the same father, the same mother. They shared the same womb. They were even conceived in the same moment. And this proves that God did not choose Jacob over Esau because of his birth or his lineage or his parentage or his ethnicity. Jacob and Esau shared those things equally. There's no reason for God in those things to pick one and not the other. If God was to choose Jacob for all of those factors, he would have to choose Esau also. Secondly, Paul eliminates the, the uh, personal actions as a condition for God's choice. We see that in verse 11. Romans 9, 11 says, For the children not being yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purposes of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calleth. Paul points out two important aspects of God's election of Jacob here. And, and his, then he also brings in the fact that God announced that choice to Rebekah, Jacob's mother. First, he mentions the timing of this choice and the timing of the announcement. God chose Jacob over Esau before they were born. That's what he says, before the twins were born. And God chose Jacob over Esau 
then before also they before they had done any deeds whether they were good deeds or evil deeds and so God was not looking at good things that Jacob had done or maybe rejecting Esau because of some bad thing Esau had done uh, those are ruled out and then God announces his choice to Rebecca in Genesis 25 23 uh, this is what God says to Rebecca the older shall serve the younger and that is a revolution uh, it was revolutionary to people like Rebecca. The older serving the younger, that is backwards. And so not only is God not considering their birthright, he is reversing the order. He's choosing the wrong one in man's eyes. And so he has removed um, so many conditions by the timing of his, uh, of his choice. And now... He, Paul describes the basis of God's choice in electing and choosing Jacob. He does this in the form of a negation and an assertion. To, to describe the basis of the, of, or basically the foundation for why God chose Jacob, he gives us a negation and an assertion. Here's the negation in verse 11. Not of works. All right? Negation, not of works. And here's the assertion, but of him that calleth. God's electing purpose did not stand upon the grounds of any good or evil deed found in Jacob and Esau. He eliminates, he eliminates any actions. That is, not just the fact that they had not yet done works. He had mentioned that already, right, in verse 11, before they had done anything good or evil. So he's already mentioned that. Now he comes back and says, not of works as a foundation. So it's not like God could look, in if, if he's going to say this, he's not looking forward into time, looking into Jacob's life and saying, oh, I see something good in him, some work, some action of Jacob that will cause me to choose him. He is eliminating that time is not the issue here. The issue is the foundation. And the entire basis of God's choice is not in Jacob. It is in himself, his will, his own purpose. God's foundation for his choice is himself. And this parallel is very important. Election is not based on works. So, in election, what is the opposite of works. See if you guys know the answer to this one, right, class? What is the opposite of works? Faith. All right. That is correct in justification. But we're talking about election here. What does Paul say is the opposite of works in our text? Not of works, but of him that calleth. All right. This is very important. Remember, I mentioned this a few weeks ago and going through this passage. We are, Paul presents salvation from man's point of view and from God's point of view. All right? And right now we're talking about salvation from God's point of view, not from man's point of view. In the end of chapter 9, we're going to get back to man's point of view. I'm going to read verses 30 and so on. But in election... In justification, faith is the opposite of works. We're justified by faith, not by works, right? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Uh, Romans 3, 28, in justification is by faith, not by works. Even in this chapter, Romans 9, 32, just look down there, uh, and it says, Wherefore, why has Israel not attained to the law of righteousness? Because they sought it not by what? By faith but as it were by the works of the law. So their faith and works are the opposite. But in this text, when talking about election, faith is not the opposite of works. Faith, uh, the opposite of works is him who called. Election emphasizes salvation from God's point of view. Now, if the Holy Spirit wanted to say that in election, God made his choice on the basis of foreseeing faith in Jacob, he could have said that right here. But he doesn't. He says God did not choose on the basis of works, but on the basis of himself, the one who calls. So the point here is not time. Paul, Paul refers to the basis of God's choice, and it eliminates any condition that Jacob might meet in order to make 
God choose him? Paul then quotes scripture to support his claim that God chose Jacob over Esau unconditionally. And it's in verse 13. As it is written, that means he's going to the Bible, he's going to the scripture. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. He's quoting from Malachi chapter 1. And look at verse 2 there. Uh, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob and hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And so, excuse me, the prophet's carrying on a kind of a conversation with, with uh, God as representing Israel. And, and they say, how, God, how have you loved us? And God's answer to that is a question. The answer is a question with a question. God, how have you loved us? And his answer is, wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? And what's the next word there? Yet. Yeah. In spite of that fact, these guys were even. There's no reason for me to choose Jacob. They're brothers. There's no reason for me to choose one or the other, humanly speaking, anyway. Yet I chose Jacob. What does Paul mean by saying God loved Jacob and hated Esau? And this makes people uncomfortable. So some interpreters say that by hated, the scripture means that God loved Jacob so much that it seemed like he hated, he, he hated Esau. And there's some warrant for that in, in, uh, in uh, Jewish writings. But this cannot really be the case for two reasons. Reason number one, Malachi describes God's hatred for Esau and Edom, his descendants, in active terms. He lays waste to their land. He tears down buildings and his anger on them it abides forever in verse 4. And so God's uh, hatred of Esau, is, it's, it's described by the prophet in active terms. But also reason number two, why I think uh, hated doesn't mean loved less, is that Esau basically, uh, God hated Esau basically means that God rejected him. The connection of this quotation in our text in, in verse 12 suggests that God's love is the same as election. Um, God chose Jacob to inherit the uh, blessings promised first to Abraham. And God chose Jacob. God loved Jacob. That's, it it kind of fits together there. And so we can define hatred by, here by its opposite, by love. If, God lo if God's love of Jacob consists of his choosing Jacob to inherit the blessings promised to Abraham, then God's hatred of Esau is best understood to refer to God's decision not to choose Esau for those blessings. So God hated means God rejected Esau. Love and hate here then are not emotions so much that God feels as much as they are actions that he carries out. They're not devo devoid of emotions. I don't want to I don't want to destroy that word, but it's really referring to the actions that God carries out toward them. God chose Jacob and he rejected Esau. That's the point. Paul uses the word election in this text to describe God's plan. God's plan had unfolded in the Old Testament by a series of free choices that he has made. Isaac was cho chosen. Ishmael was not. Jacob was chosen. Esau was not. And by these choices, God guaranteed that his plan to bring into existence a people who would be his particular peculiar possession would stand. That plan would stand, it would remain, it would not fail. If God's plan then depended on sinful, changing human beings for it to continue, then indeed, God's word would fail. It would have fallen to the ground long ago, but God's purpose in history is fulfilled because he himself elects he chooses people to be part of that purpose it depends on him God's promise fulfilled his purpose in Jacob and not Esau what does this have to do with us right these people all lived a long time ago it's almost lunchtime what does this have to do with us pastor if you have received God's promise he will fulfill his purpose in you. See his track record. Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. They all were kind of not great people. <laughs> he didn't choose. Jacob's a rascal. I would never have chosen Jacob. 
If I'm God, I choose Esau. Right? If you've received God's promise, he will fulfill his purpose in you. How do you know, then, if you've received God's promise? Do you have to wonder, is it stamped elect on my collar back here? How do you know you are one of his children and his promises are for you? Well, Galatians 4.28 puts it pretty clearly. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Who are the brethren that are the children of promise? Just like Isaac was. God's promise to Isaac never failed. We're the children of promise. You see, God's son, Jesus Christ, fulfilled his will by dying on the cross for our sins. His perfect sacrifice paid the penalty for your sins, for my sins, so that God would forgive you of your sins and bring you into his family to make you one of the children of his promise. How does that work? It's described for us in Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. He goes on to describe this purpose in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're starting to see the human perspective of salvation there now. If you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can know God's promises are for you and his promises never fail. You receive Christ as your Savior by believing, by trusting Christ, the sacrifice he made on the cross. You can count on God's promise of eternal salvation because God's promise always accomplishes God's purpose. Our salvation is secure in the sovereignty of God. His word has not failed. It has not fallen. It never will. Let's anchor our hope then in and our trust in the sovereignty of God. Trusting God's sovereignty and salvation has many benefits. It fosters humility and gratitude. Someone, a, a woman once came to Charles Spurgeon and said to him, she said, I cannot, uh, I, cannot under, I cannot understand why God should say he hated Esau. To which Spurgeon replied, Madam, that is not my difficulty. My trouble is to understand how God could love Jacob. I, with Spurgeon, am astounded that God could love me. And give me his grace. Because you see, neither Jacob nor Esau deserve to be chosen. They both deserve to be rejected. And it was grace that chose Jacob. Trusting God's sovereignty and salvation brings gratitude and humility. But it also bolsters confidence. Confidence for evangelism. Tell someone about Christ. It doesn't depend on your cleverness. Share the gospel with them. God does the work. We were talking about that in Sunday school, right? People are lost. They're blinded by the God of this world. How can they be woken up? Not by our cleverness. Simply by faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. You say, well, what if they're not the elect? God doesn't care to tell you who's elect and who's not. Or me either. All he says is share the gospel. If they trust Christ as their savior, boom, they're elect. All right? And because of that, it's not up to me. It is only for me to obey and share the gospel. I can have absolute confidence in evangelism and telling others about Christ. And it gives me confidence for peace about the future, knowing that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. So trusting God's sovereignty and salvation enables enables us so that we can truly sing, standing on the promises 
of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love strong cord, overcoming daily by the spirit sword standing on the promises of God. 